In Existentialism is a Humanism by Jean-Paul Sartre, Sartre explains that any approach to life that declares itself under the existentialist banner must at the very least be committed to the tenet that existence precedes essence. A fancy phrase, but all that means is existentialists reject the idea that we have a certain nature or a certain inherited personality or that our circumstances, our upbringing or anything else shape us in ways that we cannot transcend. Rather, the existentialist buys into the idea that we are radically free as human beings, as these autonomous free entities, to invent ourselves, to reinvent ourselves, to make all of the important and unimportant decisions about our lives. And so that's what existentialism is. Now there's some implications of this, and they lead to what Sartre expects to be some negative emotions. So it's kind of a warning, hey, you've got this great freedom, but with it comes some responsibility and reflection on that responsibility is probably gonna lead you to experience some negative things. The first of those negative things would be a sense of anguish. And that sense of anguish comes from the realization that the fact that you're at this stage of your life and you've achieved this and you've not achieved that and you've made these mistakes, every bit of that is on you. Whatever you've made of yourself, whatever you're making of yourself, you can't blame it on your parents. You can't say, well, that's the way my daddy taught me. And that was the negative example that I saw. And that's because that one time when I was in third grade, whatever, no excuses. You're radically free as a, as a human being, suck it up, move forward. But what comes with that is this anguish, powerful responsibility and some dread over that. The second negative emotion is a special sort of anguish and it's what Sartre calls, and he borrows this from Christian existentialist Kierkegaard, the anguish of Abraham. Abraham in the Bible is told by an angel that God wants him to kill one of his sons. And so Abraham prepares to kill his son and he pulls out a knife and he's about to do it. In fact, he's in the process. He's not actually cut the guy yet, but he's, you know, coming down. And God intervenes and says, nope, nope, never mind, never mind. You have proven your faith. You have proven your, your obedience. It's all good. Well, the anguish of Abraham is that how did Abraham know that the voice he was hearing was coming from an angel from heaven or not from a demon? How did he know it wasn't just voices in his head, something that he ate, he's becoming senile? He had to act on imperfect knowledge. He had to do all this as a matter of faith, but knowing in the back of his mind, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And look what's at stake, my son's life. We all have, have similar, of course, not to that extent, but similar trouble making decisions with imperfect information. We make decisions all the time that are going to impact people that we care about, sometimes in significant ways, and we can't know for sure the outcome of those decisions. But we have responsibility for those decisions. So this great responsibility, the freedom leads to the responsibility, leads to the general anguish, leads to the anguish of Abraham because we still have to make decisions with huge impacts, with imperfect knowledge, but the weight is on us. That's the second sort of anguish and the second negative emotion. The third is called forlornness. And Sartre borrows this from Heidegger. And Heidegger, an atheist existentialist, argued that when we try to do morality in particular without a, a deity, without some sort of a, a religious grounding, we're kind of at sea. It's kind of the case that we don't have anything to cling to, as Sartre explained, as he conveys it and as he summarizes it. And this leads to a, a sort of depression, a sort of realization that, man, we've got to figure this out. I don't know how we're going to figure this out. We don't have anything to ground ethics in. That emotion, that experience is called forlornness. And the last negative emotion that existentialism is apt to produce is despair. And the sense of despair comes from realization that the things that we control are very limited and our ability control them, to control them is also very limited. So you've got this huge freedom with a huge responsibility and very little ability to actually control things. And we'd also realize that once we die, our ability to control things goes away even more. You might be able to put some things in your will or erect some laws or whatnot, but so the, the situation that you find yourself in is that you have this huge responsibility, which leads to the anguish. You have imperfect information, which leads to the anguish of Abraham. You're all by yourself trying to figure out ethics without anywhere to ground it, which leads to the forlornness. And you realize that the impact of your decisions is limited, which leads to the despair. 
Ta -da, welcome to existentialism. <laughs> Sartre, if you're trying to sell it, this might not be the best way. Sartre goes on to talk about ethics a little bit and how he might suggest folks go about doing ethics. And he thinks that there is a higher level of despair that we, we experience or we should experience when we realize that we make decisions from this perspective of radical freedom that we're kind of suggesting that the decisions we make should be applicable to everyone else. Because after all, if I'm a fully free individual and I'm making this ethical decision from an autonomous perspective, I've thought through it rationally, I've used all the reasons available to me, I'm making what I consider is the best decision, this suggests everybody else should also do that. Wow, that's, that's a pretty weighty decision as well. Now, this sounds a little bit like Kant's universalizability test from his categorical imperative. But it's not. It's not the same thing. And in fact, Sartre actually criticizes Kant. He doesn't criticize his universalizability test, but instead he criticizes the other formulation of the categorical imperative, which says that we should treat persons as ends in themselves and never as mere means. And he criticizes that on grounds that it's unclear in many circumstances. He gives the real example of a young man that came to him and said, look, my mother is a widow, but I want to go fight in the war. I want to go fight the Germans. How do I treat both of, the, of them, my mother and my countrymen, my brothers in arms potentially, as ends in themselves and not as mere means? I've got this conflict. How do I respect both of those, those obligations? Sartre argues that just using Kantian ethics alone, you can't resolve that. And so his advice to this young man, and apparently his advice to us, is that when you think through an ethical decision in this way, you've considered the various ethical approaches, and you're at an impasse, you should follow your gut. Wherever your intuition is leading, wherever your, your feelings are leaning the most powerfully, that's what you, sh you should do. So there's some Sartre in ethics. I suspect it's the case that he unpacks this and elaborates on it further elsewhere in his writings, just basing this on a very brief article. He closes the article with some emphasis on the fact that you can't make any excuses. People want to hide behind the shield that I'm from this, I went to this school, or I'm from this area, or I was born with this handicap, or whatever. Sartre says you got to suck it up and accept responsibility for where you're at, for who you are, where you're going, and what you're doing right now. And in fact, he, he provides a pretty biting quote. I'm using an anthology by uh, Cardwell and Mashburn, Growing in Wisdom. And on the top of page 283, he says, According to this, we can understand, oh, he, he says that the responsibility that existentialists advocate for scares people. And here's why. He says, according to this, we can understand why our doctrine horrifies certain people, because often the only way they can bear their wretchedness is to think, circumstances have been against me. What I've been and done doesn't show my true worth. To be sure, I've had no great love, no great friendship, but that's because I haven't met a man or woman who was worthy. The books I've written haven't been very good because, well, I just haven't had the proper leisure. I haven't had children to devote myself to because I didn't find a man with whom I could have spent my life. So there remains within me, unused and quite viable, a host of propensities, inclinations, possibilities that one wouldn't guess from the mere series of things that I've done. Sartre says, stop fooling yourself. You're not fooling anybody else. Your life, you it's determined by the things you've actually done. Quit pretending. Nobody's buying any of that nonsense. Suck it up right now. However much time you've got left, make the most of it and accept that grave and that great and that very serious responsibility. So that's my overview, my take on the article. First of all, from the perspective of a philosophical ethicist, I don't think it's the case that if you are doing ethics from an a-religious perspective that you're necessarily going to feel this sense of forlornness that Kierkegaard, I'm sorry, that um, Sartre expects and Heidegger also expected. You might feel this initially, but it's the case that ethicists have worked out several different ethical theories from an a-religious perspective that can motivate people simply from a sense of uh, fidelity to reason and rationality, to do what, what seems to be logically consistent with the right thing to do. And so um, I don't think it would necessarily be the case. I mean, you might feel this see for a little while. You may think when you first start doing philosophical ethics, how am I going to do this? But even when there are impasses and even when it's not clear what you should do and even when ethical theories recommend conflicting courses of action, there are even ways to work through that. There's Postel's All Things Considered approach. So you can read about all that stuff in my Ethics in a Nutshell, chapters 5 and I think chapter 8. Second, as a political philosopher, I think this emphasis on 
our freedom in this rejection of outside influences neglects the fa fact that many outside influences have a huge impact on our ability to succeed, especially financially, but in other ways in this world. The parents that we just happen to, to have, we don't do anything to deserve our parents, we just have them. Maybe they're educated and nurturing and loving. Maybe they're abusive and uh, anti-educational. And maybe they, they send you through um, 12, 13 years of the very best private school, school with the very best teachers in the world. Or maybe you go through a terrible school system and you're not taught hardly anything at all. Of course it's the case that people, once they're out of school and once they're away from their parents, they can make decisions and they can change their lives. And there are lots of examples of people who have done this and went from rags to riches. But it's also the case that that upbringing can either give you a huge head start or it can start you out way behind. It's going to be an uphill climb if you start out way behind in, in the wrong sorts of ways. Um, our handicaps, our talents, I could be born with some sort of a mental impairment, a physical impairment, versus some physical gift like LeBron James or some genius, whether it's musical or it's writing or anything. So um, existentialism, if, if this is the way that, that we're supposed to accept it, um, I think it, it's not going to work out very well in political philosophy because it's not going to be grounded in what seems to be actually the case. As just a general philosopher, I, I found that the, the lack of argumentation behind the, the claims regarding our personal freedom and such, I found that to be a little bit disturbing. I suspect it's, it's unpacked somewhere else. Maybe they've got a, a uh, account of what it means to be free and they've rejected the deterministic arguments. But even if you don't get into the free will debate, you don't get, get into the nuances and the, down into the weeds of that discussion, just up at the higher level. And when you recognize the things that I just mentioned that definitely have impact on our, our lives and our characters and our ability to, to do various things and be successful or unsuccessful in various ways and the challenges that we face, the fact that the approach seems to neglect all that and say, hey, if you buy into this idea, if you start with the premise of that, we're radically free in this way, here are some implications. And you should buy into this because it's going to be personally beneficial or whatever argument they might give. It just doesn't seem to, to be grounded in actual uh, reason or what's actually the case. And that as a philosopher, that's the sort of thing I want. I want to build it from the ground up to be able to tie this aspect of it back to reality and not just jump in at that very high level and then go from there. Last, as just a human being, how did I react to the article? On the one hand, it was a little bit depressing and sobering to, to be beat over the head that, hey, Matt, where you're at right now, the things that you've not accomplished, the mistakes that you've made, you can't blame that on anybody. You can't blame that on circumstance. You can't blame that on upbringing. You can't blame that on anything, but it's all on you. So that was a little bit depressing, but at the same time, the emphasis on the freedom and that responsibility and that power to change and to reinvent and to formulate a life plan and to envision the person that you want to be and to actually act on that and bring it about, that was empowering. As I was reading it, I found myself sitting up straighter. That was the physical response from emotionally reading the article and absorbing the ideas. I sat up straighter. I, I recognized the, the gravity of the freedom that we have, even if this isn't all based back on the free will determinism debate. Assume for the sake of argument, we are very much responsible. We do have a great deal of power over who we are and what we become and what we're doing. It's a cool thing to think about and a cool thing to accept. So I hope you've enjoyed the summary. Go check out the article yourself. It's not very long. And thank you as always.